I'm going to ask you, Andy, I know, to introduce yourself. I sure will. SUNY at Albany. No, absolutely no, not, but that's all right. Not. I'll correct that. Oh, but that's where we met, so hey. Right. Thanks, Blanche. Um, uh, I'm Andy Pfeffer. I teach history at Union College in Schenectady, New York. Uh, I'm going to talk about, um, and that's about the extent of my biography right now. Um, I'm going to talk about Alice Citron, a uh, school teacher who was investigated over the course and, and persecuted over the course of her entire career in the school system uh, from uh, 1931 until uh, 1950 when she was suspended and then, uh, and then fired um, from the school system for uh, refusing to uh, answer questions to the superintendent of schools that were mandated under the Feinberg Law. Feinberg Law was a 1949 law, and uh, it was passed, an anti communist law was passed in 1949. Uh, and she was the first wave of Feinberg Law uh, dismissees. Uh, eight uh, teachers were dismissed from the uh, school system in 1950 uh, 51. Alice, at Alice Citron's October 1950 hearings on charges of insubordination and conduct on becoming a teacher, ten Harlem mothers, as they were identified in the press, spoke on her behalf. The women testified to Citron's character as well as her qualities as a teacher, her dedication to her students, her involvement in community, community affairs, and her successful efforts to reform the curriculum and renovate local schools. Known for her integrity throughout Harlem, she was everything to our neighborhood, to the community as a whole, according to Rose Gallant, one of the ten women. Everybody loves Alice, declared Pearl Messiah. Everybody loves her, even the children. People who have not got children know that she is for us. There was nothing particularly surprising about this strategy of bringing mothers down to testify on an accused teacher's behalf. They had a kind of standing with the press and the public that Citron, who was neither a parent nor a resident of Harlem, Lacked. In attending the hearing, the women lent their maternal authority to efforts by Citron and her lawyer to shift the focus of the prosecution away from the narrow question of Citron's insubordination, that is, her refusal to answer questions about party membership mandated by the state's recently passed Feinberg Law, and towards the evidence of her exemplary teaching. For this reason, Citron asked that her hearings be public to give Harlem parents their day in court, so to speak, but also to shame school authorities into considering matters of greater consequence to New Yorkers, or so Citron thought, than whether their teachers were communists. These parents also entered the courtroom as visible evidence of Citron's backing in the network of neighborhoods and school districts comprising much of black working class Harlem, where Citron did indeed have many supporters. In fact, the testimonial had been held the evening before on Citron's behalf at an Elks Lodge on 126th Street. Hundreds attended as the school officials present at Citron's trial were made aware. This was a strategy Citron had used before to good effect when called in 1941 to a private interrogation by the state legislature's <coughs> Ralph Kuderi in an earlier probe into communist influence in the city's public schools and municipal colleges. The Kuderi Committee appears to have lost interest in her testimony upon hearing in the hallway outside the committee's Wall Street meeting room Citron's angry friends and supporters brought down that day from Harlem, where they too had had a well-attended meeting the night before. But by October 1950, when Citron's Board of Education trial took place, the board, with the help of the Feinberg and other laws, had effectively closed off consideration of Citron's record as a teacher, not to mention her service to Harlem communities. Instead, it merely needed to show that her refusal to answer questions about her association with the Communist Party violated the law. The law by that point in the history of the Red Scare took care of the rest, supposedly having already established that such associations committed her to acts of classroom indoctrination and to the party's alleged agenda of violent overthrow of democratic government. The board, of course, had no evidence that Citron practiced either classroom subversion or revolutionary insurrection. As Citron's friend Morris Shappies quipped, quote, Ms. Citron and the other seven teachers with whom she was accused of are not presently guilty of misconduct in the classroom, but at some time in the future they might be. So they ought to be fired now before they can be guilty. <laughs> Chappies called these preventive dismissals. Citron and her lawyers knew that it would be an uphill battle to shift the terms of her indictment from this matter of guilt by association 
or by anticipation, as the lawyer for another accused teacher put it. And the appearance of the Harlem mothers can be seen as a last-ditch attempt to do just that. Should I stop or should I go? Stop? Still, it's not as if the board didn't care about Citron's record. And one might argue that the Harlem mothers reminded Citron's accusers of exactly what it was they were firing her for. In this sense, the women's deployment as sources of maternal and communal authority may have even hurt Citron's case, for their presence recalled Citron's highly successful career organizing Harlem parents into an effective force in school politics, a constant thorn in the side of the managers of the city's public education system, as well as a source of embarrassment for conservatives and liberals, corrupt politicians and reformers alike. The appearance of the Harlem mothers, and Harlem mothers should always be in quotes, not the way the press characterizes The appearance of the Harlem mothers also signaled a subject position that Citron and her supporters were forced into, a gendered one, shaped not only by the assertion of maternal authority on the part of her defense team, but also by the abiding prejudices of the judges and prosecutors seated before her, who viewed mass mobilization in Harlem of mothers, communities in distress, and communist teachers as a threat to the rational order of law and deliberation that continued much of masculine, or that constituted much of masculine public authority. As a teacher and union activist, Citron could be found at the center of most popular front school reform in Harlem, where she fought from 1931 until her suspension in 1950. Born in 1908 to immigrant Jewish garment workers living in Omaha, Nebraska, Citron was raised in Harlem and the Bronx. Following the path of many first-generation working-class women, Citron graduated Hunter College in 1928. In 1931, she joined the te teaching staff at PS 184, then a grammar school on 116th Street between Lenox and Fifth Avenues, and remained there for her entire 18 years in the system. <coughs> she recalled being, quote, shocked at the hunger and despair in the eyes of the boys and girls, unquote, when standing for the first time before her second grade class. A transient hotel, as she put it, that indifferent teachers passed through on temporary and often punitive assignment, PS 184, like many schools in the district, was in deplorable condition, much worse than counterparts elsewhere in the city. No new grammar school was built in Harlem between 1909 and 1938, and the ones in operation were so overcrowded that many ran on two or even three sessions, some of them only four hours in duration. In 1935, most Harlem schools lacked adequate toilets and washrooms, two still provided only unheated outdoor facilities with no place for children to wash up. The city fire commissioner raided four school buildings fire traps. When one principal arrived in spring of 1935 for his new position at PS5, a primary school just off the campus of City College, he found, quote, the building in such condition that it was a disgrace. The halls and stairs were used as urinals at his worst. The whole building stunk. You opened the front door and you entered the charnel house. These conditions led Citron to join Harlem parents in organizing their first parents' association in 1932. With Harlem residents backing her and with the help of fellow members of her union, Local 5 of the American Federation of Teachers, Citron then began to force the issue of school conditions before the Board of Education. At the time, populated by Tammany appointees notorious for using the school system as a source of graft, patronage appointments, and no-bid contracts. Finding the racism of texts assigned to her classes deplorable, Citron and her colleagues wrote new lesson plans that revised the teaching of African American and African history and culture. The movement of parents, teachers, and community leaders that she helped create eventually forced the establishment of Black History Week in the city's public schools, much to the irritation of school administrators, some of whom wrote the books that Citron and fellow teachers discarded, including William Jansen, who later yeah. would become superintendent of schools and who would bring the charges against Citron that led to her dismissal. Mm. Meanwhile, Citron made the welfare of the community central to her life as a teacher, as she successfully demanded, along with parents and other teachers, communist as well as non-communist, free school lunch programs, federally subsidized milk, the inclusion of health services in the schools, and the creation of after-school programs. She also took on extracurricular responsibility for the welfare of her students, and regularly visited their homes, conferring with their families and helping them participate in the education of their children. Always available to parents for children in crisis, Citron dug into her own pockets to cover school books, lunches, <coughs> milk money, and bus fare. It was not surprising that, as one of the Harlem mothers attested, Citron could not walk down Lenox Avenue without being recognized and engaged by local <coughs> residents. 
Many considered her an integral part of their families. Yet if according to the Harlem mother's testimony, Citron's presence in their communities, schools, and families made her kin of sorts, at the same time it made her the target of school administrators for whom such kinship might be a problem. In the spring of 1933, the superintendent of schools brought charges against her for deficiencies in loyalty, courtesy, and self-control. His main complaint was that she had failed to speak up in the board, board's defense when, at a meeting of the Harlem Parents Association, a local resident denounced conditions in Harlem schools. That's not Citron herself, but somebody else in the audience. Clearly, her loyalties were improperly divided. And then again, such loyalty worked both ways. Her ability to bring out supporters in large numbers for mass actions, as communist teachers called their well-organized demonstrations, was a major administrative sore point. It was often at the head of a crowd of parents, teachers, and students that Citron forced issues onto the agenda of the city's public agencies. When in 1936, a white principal allegedly beat a black teenager for accompanying his younger cousin into a restricted section of the school building, Citron led the protest demanding the principal's removal, including a mock trial at the Abyssinian Baptist Church and demonstrations at the school's entrance. The principal, an avowed racist, obsessed with discipline and routinely hostile to parents, eventually was transferred, but the campaign raised a storm of indignation about the tactics used by communists to accomplish their goals. The Teachers Guild, an explicitly anti-communist but liberal and social democratic union that split off from Local 5 in the fall of 1935, charged Citron's union, that is, Local 5, the remainder of Local 5, which they alleged was communist-led, with, quote, promoting race riots and class war, unquote, by joining Harlem parents and community leaders in demanding an investigation of the principal's actions. Later, these charges, in nearly the same language, were recycled by the rap Kuderit Committee into its 1942 report, which in turn was incorporated into post-war prosecutions, including Citron's own. So it was not only loyalty to the people of Harlem that raised suspicions about Citron, it was also the form of that loyalty, the engagement of the kinds of mass mobilization promoted by the Communist Party after 1930, when it began to emphasize neighborhood-level organizing and to address the immediate and daily needs of working-class families in severe economic distress. Long before the Soviet Union presented any real threat to American national security, that's important, that's why I emphasized it. It was such loyalty to organized disturbances, as one school official put it, that anti-communists found so menacing. This official, a deputy superintendent speaking to a Kuderit Committee investigator in 1941, had no concern at all about classroom subversion, which he considered negligible. Rather, communist teachers, quote, have a regular method of doing things. These persons now work with other teachers in the school trying to create general unrest within the school or else they work through parents' associations, unquote. He was clearly thinking of Citron, whom he had mentioned earlier in the interview. I am rather sure in Harlem that that is the technique, to stir up trouble all the time in opposition, calculated to upset the orderly administration and supervision of the schools, unquote. The promotion of mass action likewise puts Citron and fellow communists at odds with the liberal and social democratic leadership of their union, which tried to expel them in April of 1933 for factionalism and disloyalty. Disloyalty is a major issue here. This is before the 1935 split, so we're talking about the liberal social democratic leadership. By leading unemployed and underemployed teachers, who at the time were not allowed into the union, in exhibitions of public discontent, together with parents in, broad, in the broader communities they inhabited, Citron and other communists disrupted the orderly business of the union as a narrowly representative body governed by constitutive rules. What is more, such rule-violating mobilization of the disenfranchised, the liberals argued, disclosed a hidden interest in even broader social disruptions. Communists didn't care about the success of the union at representing its members' interests. Rather, they were devoted to fermenting class war and violent overthrow. That class war view, as liberal anti-communists came to call it through the 1930s and into the 1940s, in their minds disqualified communists from membership in any democratically governed body, as they could not by nature participate in good faith in rule-governed deliberations. Such bad faith and misrepresentation, which included failure to, to disclose membership in the party, moreover made communists, the liberals argued, unsuitable for employment in the schools which those liberal reformers regarded as the backbone of American democracy as, the way of, as a way of life. 
rather than directives from Moscow, it was the involvement of communists in disruptive forms of social protest that raised doubts about their loyalty, not to the nation nor to American foreign policy, but loyalty to America's allegedly exceptional democratic culture. At the same time, as, as historians Robert Schaffer, Van Goss, and Kate Weigand have pointed out, party activism in the 1930s, though by no means oriented toward classically feminist issues, the party was not good on feminist issues, was nonetheless structurally gendered. Neighborhood organizing, especially the mounting of rent and eviction <coughs> strikes, the creation of unemployed committees, as well as the building of membership around street units, galvanized the political engagement of working class women, nearly tripling their relative membership in the Communist Party, which through the 1920s had been dominated by men. The party's attention to the problems of social reproduction and the crisis of family economies during the Depression appealed directly to these women, hence the Harlem mother's personal interest in defending Citra, and through her implicitly party activism in Harlem or in Harlem schools. One could add to that argument that such organizing, together with the structural inequalities of the school system that gave men a near monopoly of supervisory and administrative roles while women occupied nearly two-thirds of the teaching positions, gendered the disruptions that anti-communists found so disturbing, pitting mixed crowds of women and men against governing bodies that were almost entirely male in composition. We should we should think of this as a gendered relationship. <coughs> One finds occasional hints as well of the gendering of that crowd as feminine, a rhetorical commonplace inherited from 19th century social psychology in the complaints of Citron's critics about the tactics she used at protests and about her intentions as a teacher and trade unionist. The Board of Superintendents nearly suspended her in 1933 for conduct unbecoming in a confrontation during a Board of Education meeting when Citron joined other, quote, hysterical women, unquote, and beating over the head with umbrellas and purses a police officer who was rousting one of their friends. Even the New York Times later acknowledged that the riot in Education Hall, as the New York Times termed it, probably was caused by the high-handedness of the board itself, which, according to witnesses, set the police on the assembly of teachers and parents gathered to claim a voice at what they thought was an open meeting. The charge of conduct on becoming a teacher leveled by the superintendents against Citron officially was for hitting the policeman with her umbrella. But it was Citron's willingness to bring that crowd of hundreds of unemployed teachers and parents to the meeting in the first place that was the real crime. In 1950, Citron did not consider herself on trial for her gender. Among the ulterior motives she perceived in the witch hunt were anti-Semitism, union busting, and racism. She wasn't wrong about that. But not sexism or misogyny. Yet one can discern a subtle and complicated connection between gender, politically and structurally understood, and her prosecution as a communist. Through her commitment to, and her persecutors' fear of, popular mobilizations in Harlem and elsewhere, signified by the testimony of her women supporters. The Harlem mother's appearance then was further evidence for the prosecutors of Citron's underlying guilt her peculiar kinship to the people of Harlem, her allegiance to the uncontrolled and uncontrollable force of the crowd, and her willingness to engage in rule-violating behavior that called into question institutions of civic authority created and run by men. Thank you.